comes to the operation of any locomotive, particularly steam locomotives, there are, of course, going to be some questions. And one of these questions, sometimes, on occasion, that we see is, what, um, what are those? Now, seriously, what are those? Why are they there? Those, those bits of metal that are just up and out next to the front of the locomotive, is that just for style? Is that some kind of art? And no, uh, some consider them stylish. It depends who you ask, but they do have a purpose. Those are smoke deflectors, so named because they, well, I was about to say deflect smoke. In the, in the technical sense, I guess they do, but not in the way you'd think, because you see them and you hear that they're called smoke deflectors, and you're probably like, well, how do they do that? They're not even where the smoke comes out. They're, they're, they're down. Well, of course, they have their own little history. Not a very long one, but one that's worth talking about because they are seen on a handful of heritage locomotives, especially ones outside of America. A few American locomotives did have them. Most obvious example was probably Union Pacific 844, but foreign locomotives especially, like Germany and in the UK, had them quite a lot. In the UK, they're sometimes called blinkers because they look like blinkers that were used on horses. So, an appropriate name. In America, we called them elephant ears because, well, yeah, you can see why we thought that. But regardless of what you call them, they're simply vertical metal plates that are attached to each side of a locomotive smoke box for the purpose of deflecting smoke away from the rest of the train whether it be the cab on the locomotive, more immediately, or just from flowing back towards the passengers. On the South Australian railways, they're sometimes called valances, as they use them too. In the early days of steam technology, the smoke deflectors weren't even really considered, or used at all, because frankly they weren't needed. Smoke, naturally, since it's hot, rises, and with the exception of being in, say, a tunnel, the smoke would generally rise above the cab and the rest of the train and not be an immediate problem. So the idea of deflecting it is never really considered. But as other elements of the technology developed, things got a bit more awkward. For two reasons. One, steam locomotives were getting faster, and therefore they'd travel towards the smoke at a greater rate. On top of that, modern locomotives were set up in such a way that the velocity of the smoke exiting the chimney was actually reduced. This is because of efficiency gains that were obtained by improved smoke box designs. Then that's great and all, but it meant that the smoke had a habit of um, lingering a lot longer and staying lower for a lot longer and flowing down and into the locomotive crew's faces. And you know, there's only so much you can pay a person before they're like, hey, guys, 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 I love my job. Also, I can't breathe. So a solution had to be come up with, and uh, the simplest one turned out to be the best. Simply put, they just stuck two pieces of metal in the front of the locomotive and called it a day. That may sound lazy when I say it like that, but the thing is, it worked. There are multiple different styles of smoke deflectors, though they all pretty much do the exact same thing. And many of them are pretty much a variation of one of two primary designs known as Windleitblecke, which means wind deflecting plates in German, assuming I said that right, which I probably didn't, and I'm sure my German following will be like, excuse me, you mispronounced one of our words again, and I'll say, yes, of course I did. I don't know what you expected me to do, but it was developed by the Deutsche Reichsbahn Gesellschaft, the German state railways, between both of the world wars. This precision German engineering of sticking two metal plates next to the locomotive smoke box consisted of the earlier, larger Wagner-type deflectors, as well as the later Vita-type deflectors. For reference, 844's deflectors are more closer to the Wagner type. So whether it's Wagner or White or some variation of them, they all essentially deflect the smoke. But how are they doing that? That is probably the question that all of you are wondering, because... From the looks of it, it doesn't seem like they would do that at all, because, well, does the smoke flow directly down? If the train's going fast, wouldn't it just go straight backward? And, yes, but, okay, so here's how this works. The deflectors don't deflect the smoke directly. Rarely do they ever touch the smoke, in fact. What they do is change the airflow at higher speeds, and the air deflects the smoke. Without smoke deflectors, the air will flow over the locomotive like normal. 
And this means that, especially at higher speeds and with more modern locomotives, the smoke will likely flow back and into people's faces and they will not appreciate it. But with the deflectors, what'll happen is the airflow will be shifted up and effectively blow the smoke in that direction, forcing it vertically and not in people's faces. As I said, it's a dirt simple solution, but the point is it worked. It kept the smoke away from the rest of the train, whether it be the locomotive's cab or the passenger coaches. And a lot of railways adopted them simply because, frankly, they were just sheet metal. Like, they're not that complex, so they were very affordable as well. Other locomotives didn't because, in a weird way, some of them didn't like them. For two reasons. They had the issue of causing drag. Not a tremendous amount to the point of being almost absurd to even complain about, but some railways were like, yeah, but this is making the train slower. No, not, not to a degree that would be alarming, but yes, it did cause a bit of drag. And for two, some people just found them ugly and they wanted their locomotives to look pretty for express passenger trains because I guess looking pretty was better than being able to breathe. Logic. But other railroads were more keen to adopt them since, um, well, they worked and, uh, they did want their passengers to be able to breathe. Also, some people don't actually dislike them at all. Some think they look great. They have a distinctive appearance. And if you look at something like the Southern Railway's Lord Nelson class, they're actually streamlined into the locomotive's body, giving a very sleek look. There are also other cases of locomotives that generally didn't go fast enough to warrant them. But in any case, when they needed them, and the railroads were willing, they were tremendously useful. Speaking of the Southern Railway, actually, they were among the first adopters and standardized their own distinctive style in that their deflectors only reach halfway up the smoke box from the running plate. They would wind tunnel test this smoke deflector design, believe it or not, and that showed that those less tall deflectors would both adequately lift the smoke on the locomotives for which they were designed, but without unduly detracting from the appearance, because again, they were looking at aesthetics, which is why Southern smoke deflectors wind up looking remarkably pretty. Whereas others are a bit more clunky, but some think that still has a bit of charm. I don't think anyone really minds 844s, for example. Yeah, they're big old elephant ears, but hey, it makes her look a little more special in my opinion. I never minded them myself. But it depends who you ask. Regardless, they have an important place in railroad history. And now, if you weren't already aware, you know what they are. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Lord Off 444, Iserfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack8401, Rescues, Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Perez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, JBL Explorers, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson, 131-232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Hayden DeGroe, Metal for Life Guy, No, Kurt Forkham, Ohio Trucker 1, Mr. Sleepy, DM Travel Typhoon, Harry, True Debris, George Kenny, Kevin Wood, Liam Wright, Morris Hillman Productions, NJ1969, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Hannah Bird, Western Colorado History, AET Museum, Ryan Wehofer, Durauchi, Murder Drone Stall, Williard Conklin, Windy City Rails, A Person 723, William Nemo, Dr. Racer 78, and of course, my dad. Till next time. This is Darkness and a Bidjuala. Fun! Farewell.